ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started. I will have to apologize for me wearing a coat right now. I'm just recovering from a pretty nasty bug. Um, you are at the Institute of World Politics for those few new faces here. We are a graduate school of statecraft and national security affairs dedicated to teaching all the instruments of national power. There are a few students currently in the room and uh, alumni as well. I'd encourage you, of which our speaker is, is one presently, I'd encourage you to ask them any questions you may have about us. Uh, I am uh, Kevin. I work here as well. Feel free to approach me. Well, let's cut right to the chase here. Uh, today we have a uh, we have a great privilege, uh, again, of welcoming Jeremy Bell. Uh, I've had the pleasure of submitting several of your presentations. Now they've all been great. And uh, today's event is sponsored by the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies, the Center for Intermarium Studies. If you're curious to learn more about either of those two initiatives, please visit our website at www.iwt.edu. <coughs> And um, I do want to reinforce that today's event is going to be off the record. Um, I'm imagining my camera's not running. I didn't set this up, uh, but I'll verify that. But, and what that basically means is, uh, of course, nothing can be ascribed to the speaker, and um, nothing can be taken from the recording. It's just in the interest of uh, protecting our speaker's identities, general best practice here. Um, and uh, today's, today's, the title of today's event is Nova Russia or Intermarium, the Fight for Don Boss. And I'm just going to briefly introduce our speaker today, and we'll get started after we give him a round of applause. So, Jared is a, uh, graduated from IWP actually just this, this year with a Master's in National Security Affairs, and you focused on uh, intelligence, is that right? You focused on intelligence. Um, very, very good story. Program here in the television studies. Uh, he received his uh, Bachelor's of Science in History from Emanuel College, and during his time at IWP, he worked uh, for the TRAC as an editorial researcher. What is the TRAC? It's a, it's a terrorism monitor. Terrorism yeah. monitor, great, great. So, brings a background in his education here and his experience working for various organizations around the community here. So, with that, I want to thank you for coming out, and let's give him a Round of applause. Thank you again. Um, no, that's actually fine. I'm a, yeah, we set that up. That's good to go. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much for being here. I know that uh, this event, I had planned on doing it earlier in the summer, but I had to postpone. So if you were planning to attend at that time, then um, I, I apologize for that, but I'm glad that you're still here. Um, I uh, wanted to thank uh, the Professor Vikavich for asking me to come here and give this today. Um, I'm not one to give lectures, but I was happy to do it, um, so here I am. Um, so I'm just going to move right along. Um, if you don't mind holding your questions until the end, I'd be very happy to answer your questions. Um, but I'd like to get through the presentation as quick as I can so that we can have a discussion. Um, just some beginning notes. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, as I've written up here, I do not speak Russian. Um, I have an elementary understanding of it and of Cyrillic, but I try to enunciate Russian terms as best as I can. So for the Russians or Russian speakers here, um, I do apologize in advance. Um, the second point I wanted to make, which I feel sometimes when we talk about Russia, um, here in the, either in the West or especially in the United States, um, it's uh, become to be something of a buzzword for the, the bad guy. Um, and so what I want to make clear today is that when I refer to Russia in this presentation, um, I do mean that uh, the government and the political elites throughout history as opposed to the people. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Russia a few years ago, and I went to the East, and I went to the West, and I only met kind and accommodating people everywhere I went. So, um, again, we're talking about the government here today. Um, so, the other thing I wanted to say was, as Kevin mentioned, everything is off the record, and, but the thoughts and opinions are my own that I mentioned today. Um, and last, um, I just wanted to sort of dedicate this lecture today to the um, victims of communism, especially in Ukraine, that lost their lives in the 20th century, that are oftentimes forgotten 
uh, just the scale and, and breadth of, of those who died. So I'm just going to move right along. Um, what is this idea of New Russia, um, which is what Novorossiya stands for? Is it to suggest that Russia surrounding Moscow, originating from what is today considered the um, greater Belarusian swamplands, um, was it not good enough in an imperial context? Um, mainstream historiography tends to suggest over and over that uh, Ukraine is sort of a son of none, and that it is indeed a borderland, and that the name of Ukraine proves this. Um, the conventional historiography, from what I understand, goes like this. Um, in most of Slavic languages, Crimea means country or land. Um, and uh, in the word Krai in Russian is used this way too. Um, regions in and provinces of Russia is either oblast or Krai, depending on the um, ethnic autonomy of that region. Um, but its second meaning, edge, or boundary, is often pitched by Russia to interpret the word Ukraine as borderland. Um, but this doesn't explain the extent of the meaning because it's derivative of a Russian explanation. Um, even more, the extrapolation is made that because Ukraine simply means borderland, it must therefore be nothing more than a borderland. Um, the nominalism has been repackaged into all kinds of warfare throughout the years. As we will soon discuss, this level of explanation leaves something lacking. It's not a sufficient answer as to why there is a war going on, or that a nation and nationhood does not exist in Ukraine. Um, so this, it's an intellectual fog that has, been, that has surrounded the meaning of Ukraine for a long time, and that's what we're going to discuss. Um, this is essentially a clash of ideas explained perfectly in a single and profound statement by um, international relations scholar Anna Bozeman, who was actually a close friend of this institution before she died. In her 1974 essay, War and the Clash of Ideas, she said, and I quote here is up here, um, Nowhere outside North America and Northern Europe does one encounter the overriding desire to avoid armed conflict and to seek peaceful settlements of disputes that lading peace-minded scholars in our society tend to be generally present. They have not thought of war as a complex of possibly quite disparate, even irreconcilable norms, values, and ideas. Just why these matters have not surfaced in, in the mainstream of their investigations is in itself a significant thematic motif in the clash of ideas denoted by modern warfare, and as such it should be scrutinized before going any further. End quote. So this really affected me as I was looking into this last year and earlier this year. Um, and this is what I mean by the extrapolation fallacy that is made from the nominal nature of Ukraine over the centuries. Um, I'm not entirely sure, actually, that Novorossiya is simply a product of Russian imperialism, um, because it's more fundamental than that. So by the map, as you can see up here, this map was created by the Washington Post. Um, this is the region that we're talking about, also known as Little Russia. It stretches from regions on the Russian side of Luhansk to the borders with Moldova. And you can see Alan here is the Transnistria region, which is a breakaway region in Moldova, and south to the Ukrainian area surrounding Odessa. This map is a little bit more <coughs> precise and specific when it comes to um, mapping out. You can see the regions. You can see that Crimea is still um, considered Ukrainian territory. Um, this map was built by Radio Free Liberty Radio Europe. But I like it mostly because you can see in the Russian regions um, of, of Krasnodar and Rostov and Stavropol, which would have been considered part of Novorossiya during the time of Catherine. So these are the four periods up here that I've attempted to nail down, sort of conceptualize um, when Novorossiya was imposed. Um, it was an idea that was turned into a domain under Catherine, the Enlightened Monarch. During the Russo-Turkish Wars, the Tsardom waged something of an Eastern Crusade, and Little Russia was very much a staple 
of territory for the Russians. Um, it, it, it either turned into a, something of a forward operating base during the wars, or it was a colony. It was really to serve the purposes of the Tsardom, or the Tsar, or the Tsarina. Um, so here are the four periods. I won't read them out because we're going to get into each of them, but I wanted to point out the dates that I've outlined. Uh, I've managed to argue that uh, Novorossiya as an establishment has been around since the late 17th century, um, and has not been shelved in the records of history um, to this day. And this, I think, is consistent with Professor Bozeman's vision of, of people in history and, and culture um, and knowledge and war. Um, okay, so part one is in regard to the Cossack host, the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the coming of Catherine the Great. The Russian province of Novorossiya finds its real roots in the Cossack lands of Kiev, of Napier, Ukraine. I apologize, let me go back. Um, and the uh, southern step to, Crim uh, to uh, Crimea, which is where the Zaporizhians originate from. The Cossack headmanate, or the Zaporizhian host, or simply the Cossack host, has been ruled by one principality or another, uh, from the 16th through the 18th centuries. Uh, but the Cossack story is quite unique, actually, during its history when it was an element of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, this is where the idea of the Intermarium was born. Uh, more, more or less, uh, at least a fragment of it. The idea of freedom, unprecedented for its time via the Liberum Veto. The Cossacks were a people of fierce warriors that fought against even 17th century foes from the Turks um, uh, to even the Swedes, uh, any enemy of the Commonwealth until it was no longer on the international stage at the turn of the 18th century, gathered much amongst their, and uh, excuse my pronunciation here, uh, sieges or war camps and uh, polities with markets or the bazaar and central meetings of the Rada, which was the elders along the Napier. They were generally a patriarchal patriarchal warrior people, and um, there was continuity that remained intact in the minds of men south of the marshlands, which rejected the idea of control over them. Um, Ukraine is a story of peasant identity in their homelands, and this is a motif that's reflected throughout their history. Uh, they were more or less a free society, and one that would fight against any controller. To use just one example, they did so in 1648 in a rebellion against the Commonwealth after um, Bodan Kilmelinski lost his property to a Polish official who also stole his lover and murdered his son. Kilmelinski was a registered Cossack that was enfranchised. This would become a plight basically for the political rights of the Cossacks. And uh, they'd fight the very powers that aided in such mutinies later on when their autonomy was threatened. Um, the Commonwealth found a powerful ally in the Cossacks as well, um, and they complemented the renowned Polish cavalry with deadly force in the early modern wars in defending against the Crimean Khanate. The Cossack registry was, uh, it, it, was, it only enfranchised a number of Cossacks, but it's mentioned here not to desensitize the phenomenon of Polish freedom, such as the Liberum Vito. Suffrage was not a concept that extended to the fighting Cossacks in full order because it wasn't extended to the masses of Europe either. With Catholicism spreading throughout the Orthodox Cossack lands in the early 17th century, Timothy Snyder writes that the Cossacks did not come into contact with Polish democratic norms the same way that, say, the uh, Lithuanians did. And eventually, uh, he, they faced what he called mobilization without representation. Still, for the Cossacks, the most rowdy of components of the Polish-Lithuanian Lithuanian experiment, this will remain to have been the best of their lot. Never again, from what I can see, did the Cossack state come into contact with the freedom allowed it by the law of the Commonwealth. After the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth collapsed, which led to the years of the ruin, uh, during the second half of the 17th century, 
There was simply never a time in Russian imperial history that it managed its principality without Ukraine. It is with the reign of Catherine the Great that the idea of Novorossiya was brought and established among the steppe of Ukraine, according to the sources that I can find. And which is why she is so significant in Novorossiya's historiography, its establishment, and its formation. By the 19th century, Russian autocrats vacationed on the sea and were calling it Little Russia. Ukraine became a place of special and even nostalgic importance to the imperialists and a place within the Russian Empire. As Paul Robert Noguchi writes, quote, There they spent their summer holidays in peaceful rural settings served by local little Russian peasants, whose loyal service made possible a leisurely and cultured environment much the same way that slave labor allowed for a similar way of life for white folk in the antebellum United States. End quote. I wanted to read from uh, Willard Sunderland here, um, he wrote a book, Taming the Wild Field, and he said, and I quote, The old step was Asian and stateless. The current one was state-determined and claimed for European-Russian civilization. The world of comparison uh, was now even more obviously that of the, uh, the Western empires. Consequently, it was all the more clear that the Russian empire merited its own new Russia to go along with everyone else's new Spain and new France and New England. The adoption of the name New Russia was in fact the most powerful statement imaginable of Russia's national coming of age." End quote. The second part of the study was in regard to uh, the Russo-Turkish Wars. Um, the Russo-Turkish Wars would sort of further solidify the idea of Novorossiya as a physical territory. Um, as stated before, since this is a study of war in different norms, it only makes sense that there were lots of iterations in different Russo-Turkish wars in the 18th and 19th centuries. Catherine was an active and engaged participant in the Russo-Turkish War of 1768, that ended in 1774, and it focused squarely on the territorial expansion because of the security of southern Russia, also known as Novorossiya. And it depended on ending a war that the Turks began, on charges to satisfy, satisfy Russian interests at the time. The further Russification of Ukraine's masses depended on it, and, and uh, Catherine's forces prevailed. Um, the spoils of war consolidated the empire's hold on southern Ukraine and cemented the imperial relationship uh, in southern Ukraine. Catherine's intervention uh, and the partition of Poland sparked uh, the armed conflict with the Turks, but the war for Catherine became a fight to seize the idea of the Russian state, the epicenter of which was Novorossiya. The frontier was closed with a stroke of a pen after the next Russo-Turkish war in the late 18th century, and it spooked the Ottomans, and this closure continues a, con a colonization that had already begun under Cossack control before the liquidation of the Hetmani. In fact, this is also where the false Potemkin villages range throughout history, referring to Catherine's general, Prince Grigory Potemkin, similar to Marie Antoinette's miss, quote, let them eat cake. The myth is that Potemkin created the villages for Catherine's arrival, and it is used today uh, to describe any construction, both literal or figurative, uh, built solely to deceive others into thinking that a situation is better than it is, whereas what really happened, the Cossack host was dispersed, and with some settling along what is today the Taman Peninsula, Tompkins showed the Cossack settlements to Catherine during her tour of Crimea, but these settlements were there before Catherine's tour and had nothing to do with an effort by Tompkins himself. The epic here referred to encompasses imperial integration of Ukraine's multitudes, while the fight to bring more territory into the Russian sphere raged five more times throughout the 19th century. To include the conservative shoring up of national interest in the Crimean War in 1853, the French Revolution, not the Enlightenment, would undo Catherine's raison d'etat, both because of the spirit of the state as well as its imperial ambitions. 
The long 19th century would bring with it a Tsardom in Russia after 1815 that sought to preserve Holy Rus in Novorossiya along with it. The enlightened despots in Russia and Central Europe experienced a galvanizing effect that sort of um, bolstered their role even after Voltaire himself wrote to Catherine endorsing the political takeover that ended in 1795 as a victory for toleration. Catherine wrote to her administrators in 1764, and she said these provinces should be russified in the easiest way possible so that they cease looking like wolves to the forest. The approach is easy if, if wise men are chosen as governors over the provinces. When the hetmans are gone from little Russia, every effort should be made to eradicate from memory the period and the hetmans. The third part of this study that I looked at is in regard to Soviet Ukraine. Sort of, I, I jumped forward in history to address the next large phase in Ukrainian history. Um, in regard to the first dimension, the Russification of, of Soviet Ukraine, um, there's lots of evidence here, but I'll simply say that the destruction of Ukrainian identity during the Soviet period is most certainly the linchpin assumption of this argument. Russification in Ukraine was highlighted by the erasure of the Ukrainian language, um, mass repression and murder of the Ukrainian intelligentsia, and making it illegal to inhabit any traits of the non-aligned, non-party-minded, outside of the Ukrainian Soviet bureaucratic elite. The second dimension is in regard to the Holodomor. The man-made famine, a genocide in the early 1930s in Ukraine, which was a result of the forced collectivization of the five-year plan. In a matter of, from 1932 to 1933, I believe, if my figures are correct, somewhere between 7 and 10 million people died because of this forced starvation. Um, and the current regime in Ukraine considers it a genocide. <coughs> It took on a peculiarly sinister role in Ukraine as Ukraine also underwent forced Sovietization in the spirit of the nationals policy that forced the mindset of Novorossiya into a Ukrainian reality. And of course it emanated from Stalin's government. Today, Novorossiya is used by the central government as a justification for um, managing the near abroad. So when Vladimir Putin invokes Novorossiya in regard to the lack of Ukrainian nationhood as a justification for such things as the seizure of Crimea, um, he's doing so by invoking centuries of repression and murder by government. In America, a comparative invocation would be, a, a, an historical precedent would resemble an American president referencing Japanese internment as a reason to dominate the Pacific region, with the only addition being that the U.S. government completely deracinated American Japanese citizens through well-documented starvation and cultural cleansing. In other words, it is like invoking the Holocaust. There's largely been silence in the West about the Holodomor. Robert Conquest once wrote that in determining the number of dead from the tragedy, which today stands, as I said before, somewhere between 7 and 10 million, the other estimates are more, but for the most part, it's 7 and 10 million. In his work, Harvest of Sorrow, he says that every letter of text in his book of some 350 pages would stand for 20 or so victims. I'll move on to the last part. Part four is in regard to post-Soviet Ukrainian nationalism, um, the Russian separatists, and the war in Donbass. If we're putting a time frame on it, it would be since 1992, since the fall. That's an easy time for me to pick out. I'm sure that real scholars would have a different time frame. Today, though, the fight in the Donbass pits Russian nationalism, nostalgic for a geopolitical gold standard of the past that, that never existed against um, Ukrainian fascists. Um, you, may, you may have heard today, uh, since everyone is interested in Russia these days, um, that um, Putin once said that um, the fall of the Soviet Union was the worst geopolitical disaster to happen or something like that. 
Um, I feel like that's more mainstream knowledge these days, but that's sort of the same current that runs through the, the what is the DPR and the LNR. Um, certainly, there are some real brown shirts you know, on the Ukrainian side, but uh, volunteer militias and Kievan patriarchate priests fighting the rebels are not Nazis simply because that is what the Kremlin paints them as. The Russian government exerts administrative, political, or military control over most of their borders in the Soviet, in the uh, former Soviet space. So this is not just a situation that happens in Ukraine. Um, Sofia uh, Puxley and Friedrich Vaslau uh, revealed in one of their reports for the European Council on Foreign Relations that Moscow controls what they called gray zones. Um, where they, they are the Russian idea of, of ours. Um, and even had an added hashtag everywhere within these zones for users to promote it on Twitter. Zones controlled essentially by Moscow serve as vectors resembling a buffer zone in the former Soviet space. But Donbass itself is unique. Um, Vladimir Peshkov serves up a biting evidence in regard to Ukraine and the Euromaidan. And I will quote him here. He said, quote, But Moscow misread the Donbass. The local population did not rise up against Kiev in the name of Novorossiya. The intervention did not lead to the Ukrainian government's collapse. Instead, Russia ended up bogged down in the Donbass, fighting a war without a clear exit strategy in sight. Russia now owns the Donbass. It continues to provide far-reaching military political, and military support for its proxies. Without Moscow's support, the People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk simply would not exist." End quote. And this is just the beginning. The evidence is long, and I, and I don't have time to go through each of the government and volunteer militias on both sides, but Peshkov's accounting concurs with the extravagant and um, sort of a Boy Scout-like revolution by the uh, nostalgic separatists. Um, in fact, Peshkov writes that this was all started in the early 20th, 21st century after Alexander Dugin's International Eurasian Movement, otherwise known as the Fourth Way, was published. So, uh, and especially after the 2004 Orange Revolution. <coughs> so, even today, there's a deluge of misunderstanding. Uh, through a breadth of research pertaining to why exactly there is a war in Ukraine. Most of it misses the mark. Taras Kuzio states that because most of the experts who study the post-communist world are Russianists and view the world from a Moscow-centric perspective, all of the white papers that exist and have come out since around 2014 miss the mark. Before I close, I just wanted to <coughs> bring this to our attention as just one tiny little aspect of this war. We all might remember the Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 that was shot down in, uh, in eastern Ukraine, uh, I believe it was in 2014. I should have put that up there, I can't remember at the moment. Um, where 298 civilians died, and he thought it was a Ukrainian aircraft. Um, this is the exact text from the post on uh, social media that we put up with video evidence attached. I won't read through the whole thing, um, but you can see that he certainly thought that it was an, an enemy aircraft and that civilians weren't hurt and, um, and that he even thought there was a second down airplane. Um, and of course later he took it down off of the internet after it was proven that um, that it was his fault. Now, this is all alleged, of course. Um, the, the, the Kremlin still denies culpability and Strzokov still denies responsibility, but Strzokov was a Russian agent from Moscow. This is just one tiny example of further casualties completely um, separated from this war that, um, that I am arguing um, is de delineated from the Novorossiya argument. So, as I close, the question still remains. 
Will Ukrainian citizens embrace Novorossiya or the ideals of intermarium, that which originally binded and gave Ukraine's ancestors the taste of freedom? So invocation today of Novorossiya as justification for hegemony in the near abroad is essentially just an extension of the political theater that Russia's power elite espouse. This may not be a new insight at all. In fact, I know that I'm not the first person that has been saying these things. The new um, non-institutionalized nomenclatura of Putin's patron-client kleptocracy is still searching for its soul. And I think Novorossiya, for them, is the answer. But I submit to you the question today, is it the answer for Ukraine? Thank you very much.